All right, so in our first module, we're going to be covering um, some topics that are talked in, talked about in the textbook in Chapter 1. Um, it's really just about the fundamentals of computing. So the goal of this module is not necessarily to start you off programming. Um, you, a lot of what we talk about today, or a lot of what we talk about in this module, will be sort of referred back to um, during the, the rest of the modules, um, but it's not necessarily a prerequisite for understanding programming. It's more of just a general background of how computing works. Um, so I, my, my goal with this module is just to kind of demystify a little bit um, how a computer actually works. So when we start to program it um, and we start to write some code to make the computer do what we want, um, we've got a little bit of a background, we've got a little bit of an appreciation for what's going on behind the scenes. Because uh, programming can sometimes be a little frustrating, especially when you sort of, you don't have the context and you don't understand the context um, for which your program is running on. So that's the, really the purpose of this module. Um, we're going to touch on a lot of um, topics that you might see sort of in a computer engineering course. Um, we're going to touch on, uh, we're going to talk about digital electronics and circuitry a little bit. Um, again, you know, don't be confused. This course will not be on electrical circuits. Um, it's, it's focused on programming, and this is just to give you a little bit of a lay of the land um, of the field. So the big question that we, we want to answer um, is fundamentally, what do computers do? Um, what does the, the, the actual computer, the actual machine, do for us? Um, and more importantly, probably by the end of the module, we'll see what computers don't do for us. And I think sometimes that's even, that's even more important. Um, understanding very clearly you know, what the computer doesn't do makes you understand a little bit why you need to do um, so much as a programmer, actually. Um, so there's really just two fundamental things that a computer is designed to do. The, the machine inside is just a bunch of what amount to wires, um, circuitry, electronic, um, electrical wires, but instead of copper wires flowing through a, a wall connecting to an outlet, um, they're um, grooves that are carved in silicon um, or, or silicon um, sort of veins through one of those green chips that you might have seen. Um, if you ever seen the inside of a computer. The electricity flows through the silicon just in the same way as electricity flows through copper wires to, 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 to give us electricity in our homes. Um, so we've devised electronic circuitry to do one of two different things. Um, addition, subtraction, multiply, divide, or, or arithmetic, we would put as one group of, of operations. We can perform arithmetic on numbers through this circuitry. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that's even possible today. Um, and then the second thing that we can do is we can remember things. Um, and remember meaning we can hold on to a number um, represented as electricity. Um, we're going to see directly how we represent numbers via electricity or electrical charges. And we have circuitry that can hold that charge for some given period of time. So most of what we're talking about today is main memory which can hold a charge until you unplug the computer, you, tu you turn the computer off. Um, everything else, everything that we see a computer does, you know, the, the displaying a video, reacting to a mouse, reacting to a joystick, joystick playing computer game, um, everything that you can think of the computer does really just boils down to one of these two operations. That's it. Um, the the, the reason this is possible is that a computer um, can actually do any of these operations billions and billions of times each second. Um, so if you, if you build up, if you, can, if you can do all of these multiplications and divides and, and remembering of numbers billions of times a second, you can actually accomplish a lot out of very, very small steps. When we run our programs, when we start writing programs, each command that we write, we're not going to have to write billions of commands, but each command that we write is only going to actually take fractions, tiny, tiny fractions of a second. They're going to be very, very fast. So let's, I want to start out by looking at how can a computer perform mathematical operations on numbers. And before we can even think about that, how does, if, again, we, I want to harp back to this analogy of just 
regular electrical wires it's just electricity flowing through this machine how does this machine actually represent numbers in the first place and I'm sure most of you have heard the term binary numbers and that's how we'll we'll get to that now so before we we talk about binary let's just kind of go back to basics of of how we deal with numbers in our everyday lives so from probably the age of, I don't know, maybe four, three or four or so, you've probably been exposed to regular base 10 numbers. And when I say base 10, um, I really mean um, 10 specific digits, 10 specific values. So we, we know of, of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 as the 10 specific symbols that we use to make up numbers, the negatives notwithstanding and decimal points. These are the basic symbols of our numbering system. Um, it's base 10 also because, you know, we, we just sort of, we're used to multiplying by 10. Our digits, each digit in a, in a regular number um, can have up to 10 values. Each digit to the left of the last will be 10 times um, more value as the previous. Um, that, that's what we mean when we say base 10. So, you know, just looking at the number 934, we very rarely really think about the details of how this works, but when we were learning it, we certainly did. Um, and we recognized that the first column, and we work right to left, the first column, the first digit, could have either, all, either any of these 10 symbols, and they were worth one apiece. So if you saw four, and it was just considered to be the number four. It was worth four in terms of building up the number. But because we work on a 10 base numbering system, um, as we get to, actually let me switch over and just write out these numbers for a second. Since we're working on a 10 base numbering system, the first digit, get some color here, the first digit can start at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. But as soon as we get to nine and we want to continue counting, we know that we have to go back to zero and add a one. And we recognize this value as the number 10, um, but it's also can be considered one times 10 plus zero, meaning this column is worth 10 towards our value and towards our value of our number. If I have something like 26, it's really just 2 times 10. This column is worth 10. This is worth 1, so it's just 6. And we get 20 plus 6, or 26. And so we, again, we rarely think about numbers like this, but really that's all that, that's what our numbering system is all about. So when we look at the 3, that's going to be 3 times 10, that's adding 30. And then, of course, each successive digit to the left is going to be worth 10 times the previous. So the next one is the hundredths place. And if we see a 9 there, we know that we have 900, and it's 900 plus 30 plus 4, and we end up with 934. Um, we recognize that this is sort of an infinite numbering system. right? We, we can keep adding digits as far as we can go. Um, we can also recognize pretty clearly from this that if I only use three digits, the highest number I can represent would be 999. After 999, we go back to 1,000 and everything in the hundreds, the tens, and the ones digits all go back to zero. All right, so first question, why 10? Why is it that we use a base 10 numbering system? Um, it seems completely natural to us. If you've never dealt with any other type of numbering system, it, it might be even hard to understand the question. Um, what if we only had seven symbols? Could we have a base seven numbering system where each digit was worth seven times more than the last? Um, the answer is absolutely. We, th there would be no difference. And they might seem odd, and you might say, well, the, the math wouldn't work right. It wouldn't, wouldn't feel natural. And you're right, it wouldn't feel natural. Uh, but the only reason that base 10 numbering system feels natural to us is that we've learned it all our lives. Um, there is really nothing special about the fact that we have 10 symbols. In fact, it probably really amounts to the fact that we've got 10 fingers, and that was the easiest way for people to communicate symbols for numbers. Um, so 
you can think of it as almost completely arbitrary. Um, and that actually, the, the arbitrariness of the 10 base numbering system is really what allows us to capitalize on some of the other features of other systems like a computer and devise numbering systems that potentially aren't based on the number 10. So 10 might be convenient for us, but computers, obviously, um, electrical circuits do not have fingers. Um, so if we think about our fingers as the number of different states, I can hold up two fingers and you know that it's two without me saying anything. I can communicate 10 different possibilities very, very easily just using my, my fingers. Um, think of that as, now we start to think about the analogy towards the computer. A computer is built on electric, uh, electronic circuitry. At the lowest level, an electronic circuit is, is comprised of a transistor or a series of transistors. Um, and transistors are just small little digital boxes, digital circuits that, that can control um, based on a, a third input, um, an electrical wire flowing in, can control if electricity flows through them or not. So I don't, I, the details of how a transistor works and what the material properties of that are um, are well outside the scope of, of a computer science, um, especially an intro to computer science class. Um, but we can sum up a transistor as sort of an electronic switch. It can be turned on or off. All right, and that's the key feature that we need to remember. We can control whether electricity flows through a transistor very, very um, easily, very predictably, very reliably. So a computer ultimately, or any digital logic system, so it doesn't necessarily need to be a general purpose computer, um, has two states to it, can represent two specific states, on or off. So instead of 10 states like us with 10 fingers, a computer works with two states per digit, zero or one, zero meaning off, one meaning on. And that, that analogy we want to think of, we, we want to keep really close in our minds, on and off, one and zero. Now one and zero, the zero and one, of course, probably um, reminds you of the popular binary numbering system. So the binary number system is around because computers are going to work with on or off, and that's really the only state that they can represent. And so we built a numbering system based on two digits, or two symbols, sorry, rather than 10. So in the binary system, um, we can represent any number that we can represent in the, in the 10 base numbering system without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, the number 10 in binary is going to mean very different than the number 10 over here. Um, this is the 10 base numbering system written down here. And if we were to start with, so I've got binary over on the left in blue. If we were to start at zero, we would have all zeros. Now in the binary numbering system, it's, it's very common to write all of the available digits first. All right? So we would pad to the left with all zeros. So it's very unnatural for us to write the, the number 1 as 0, 1 or 0, 0, 1. Um, but in binary, it isn't. Binary, it's considered normal to write numbers in full level digits. Now, again, if you're coming from the, from the normal counting scheme and you've never dealt with computers before, that seems a little strange because we don't really think of how many available digits do we have. If I ask you to start counting, um, you're not going to stop when you hit 9. You're just going to go right to 10. And you, you probably aren't going to think twice about counting using a second digit or a third hundredth digit or a, or a four thousandth digit. It's, it's just not going to come into your head. That's because we work in our minds and we can use an infinite number of digits. In a binary numbering system with a computer, each individual digit is going to be represented by a transistor. Um, and so the computer is only made with so many transistors. They physically are, they're, they're manufactured. Um, they're plugged into that, that circuit. And so there's a much more well-defined number of digits that we'll work with when we are using numbers in a computer system, in a binary number system. So if you've ever shopped for a computer recently, um, it's actually getting a little hard to buy a 32-bit computer. Most computers are 64-bit. Um, what that, that term means, 32 versus 64 bit, simply means how many digits we use in our numbering system. How many digits are available, how many transistors are available everywhere that we represent a number. So 
this padding, I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of using a, a four-bit or four-digit numbering system. That's, that's fine for the example here. And you can start to see how this works. Um, zero, 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 zero. Um, we'll start at zero. We start right to left, just like we've always have. Um, if we flick over here, we saw zero, one, and then all the way through until we carry, we, we, ex we exhausted all of our symbols. All right, so zero through nine, we exhausted all of our symbols, and then we started over. Well, in a binary system, the only symbols we have is zero and one. As soon as we get to zero, one, we've exhausted all of our symbols and we have to carry. So note that that is not the number 10, that's actually the number two, okay? because we've got zero, one. Each place, this place is worth one, this place is worth two, then four, then eight. And that corresponds exactly to what we saw with ones digits, ten digits, hundreds digits, and thousands digits in a base 10 system. Um, so one of the things that we, we start to recognize, though, is that binary is a lot less compact. Um, in binary system, um, we're going to start moving to the left. We're going to we're going to exhaust what we can uh, we can show in one digit much much more quickly. So we're in a ten base numbering system. Within one digit, I can represent ten. Within two digits, I can represent one hundred total numbers, zero through ninety nine. In a binary system, actually in four bits, I didn't write them all down. This went down to ten. I'll actually get to 1111, all four are ones, at 15. So using four digits in a binary numbering system, I'm only going to get to 14, to 15. All right, so again, watching how this is working, the 0, 1, we're going to carry over and add a 1 in the 2's column. We'll go back to 0 and the 1's. We add a 1. Once we get to 1, 1, we add we essentially add one over here and we're going to carry all the way through and we're going to get to 100 or 100. Zero, zero. That's not 100 in a normal sense. That's just four. Remember, this is the four place, two place, three place. Or, I'm sorry, four place, two place, and one place. Okay. So as we continue with four, then we'll have five. We'll add a one. We'll carry over. We'll propagate that. One, one, zero will be six. One, one, one will be seven. Once we add another one to that, that's going to shift us all the way back to this fourth column. Again, this is the eight digit, the four digit, the two digit, and the one digit. So eight, nine, and then ten. And then this, this process would continue all the way to one, 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 one at 15. So much less compact, just as expressive. Any number can be represented in a two bit number, a two, uh, base two numbering scheme. Um, it just has to do with how many bits you actually have. So um, when an 8-bit, if I have 8 bits, I can store the number 0 to 255, 255. Um, so that would be 8 ones straight across would, would equate back to 255. 16 bits gives me about 65,000. 32 bits, now you can see it starts to grow pretty quickly. 32 bits um, is over 4 billion. Um, so 4 billion individual numbers. And again, these numbers seem relatively arbitrary, um, but they all represent basically 111 all across. So 32 ones straight across will map to a 10 base numbering system to this sort of strange looking number. 64 bits has a much larger threshold. Um, 1.8 times 10 to the 19th is the largest number that you can represent. 64 ones straight across left to right would represent that number. Um, and that's a fairly large number, but of course, 64 digits in a 10 base numbering scheme is sort of um, you know, mind boggling. That, that's a huge number. Okay, so now given we can use this on or off mentality, we can use the transistor to represent a specific digit. Um, we can also use this on or off mentality to devise logic or to devise sort of like an algebra. So if we think about you know the regular numbering numbers that we have, the, the first thing that you learned to do with numbers was to add them and subtract them. Right? Those are the primary operations. And then eventually you learned about multiplication and division. Um, in the, the base two world, this zero or one, 
we certainly still have, have numeric addition and subtraction, but there's other operations that are actually even more fundamental, um, and that is called Boolean algebra. Um, Boolean algebra is sort of the, the language of logic, um, and we, we introduce a new set of terms that map to on or off and, and one to zero. Uh, called true and false. And it, again, it, it sort of goes without saying that one would represent on in terms of electricity is flowing through a transistor. There's a charge attached to a specific, maybe a, um, a, magnetic, um, a magnetic device or something like that. True is just going to be represented as on or one. Um, so they're, they're basically giving you three different ways to say one or zero. Um, on or off and true and false. Um, logic um, has, or bo a Boolean algebra um, to form the basis of digital logic has four or five different, or, or like, we'll just cover four here, four specific um, operations that are used. Um, the, the, the easiest one to think about is the not operator, the not operation. Um, and for Boolean logic, if an input comes in as zero or off or false, um, the not operation, whoops, I have to actually correct this. Hold on for a second. Okay, so I, I fixed that up. Sorry about that. And I'll, I'll, I'll clean that up a little later in our slides. Um, but for a, Boolean, um, for a Boolean not operation, when a false value or an off value um, comes in as an input, the output would be true. It would, the output would be one. Um, when an input comes in as one, um, we will get an output of zero. All right? So the not operation really just flips the, the output um, with the input. Again, if this was an electricity flowing through, we would represent this Boolean logic um, with some, some electrical devices and we'd have a transistor um, output one if the input was false, if the input was no charge. Um, more interestingly, we've got the ands and or operators. And we're going to come back to this later on in, in future modules because Boolean algebra and the not operator, the and and the or operators, um, they actually come into play a lot in our code as well. But at the digital level, um, it's a little bit more simplistic. Um, so for at the, at the electronic level, an AND operation, if both outputs or both inputs are false, or if either one of the inputs are false, the output would be false. In other words, the AND operation requires both of the electrical signals flowing in to come out as one. The OR operation requires either one or both. So an OR operation would take two inputs and output zero if both of them are zero. Otherwise, if either one or both are one, it would output as one. Um, exclusive OR is a little bit different. Um, exclusive OR, we, we don't actually use a lot in our code, so this will probably be the last time we talk about it um, in these, these videos. Um, but the exclusive OR, if both of them are zeros or both of them are trues, um, will output zero. So basically it has to be either or but not both to be output as one. Um, so this is kind of abstract, these, these tables, this Boolean logic and this Boolean algebra actually in terms of true and false values has been around for, for longer than computers. But what was nice about this algebra is that it can map to digital devices. Um, so when an electrical engineer um, starts to work with Boolean logic, they actually c go and create. And it, it requires 20 or 30 different transistors. Right? So now we start to think about hardware circuits. Circuits, you know, electricity um, flowing in and out of these circuits, and these circuits are made up of 20 or 30 transistors. And they've got, for an AND or an OR operator, they've got two inputs um, and then one output. So you can almost think about this as a physical box with two wires flowing into them and one wire flowing out. And if you put an electrical signal onto or an electrical current in A and B, um, in the first two inputs, the AND operator or the AND circuit will output true or will, will have electricity flowing through it. If either one or both are not transmitting electricity through the inputs, then the output will be false. The output will be dead. 
in the OR, for the OR operator, we would have two electrical wires flowing into this device, and if either one had electricity, electricity would flow out. For this NOT operator, if electricity flows in, nothing will flow out. If nothing comes in, electricity flows out. And obviously, there's some currents going through this to produce that electricity. Now, the internal workings of these are not really that important for us as computer scientists, but um, we like to be able to think about them and, and understand how they work a, a bit. Um, so these are typically called logic gates. Um, the term gate is, is, is kind of a misnomer. It's really just you know, simply a, a little piece of hardware with a bunch of transistors connected to each other. But the most important part is that they implement real actual Boolean logic. So we can have in hardware, you can buy, if, you, if you work in a computer engineering lab um, to learn how to do this stuff, you can, you can literally pick an OR gate and an, uh, an AND gate out of a little box that are you know, the size of the, the tip of your thumb and plug them into a digital circuit board and try to actually configure things and make them work together. So they're real actual hardware circuits that implement in electricity the AND, OR, and NOT operators and also exclusive OR is, is, exists as well. And these are just the electrical um, symbols for that kind of stuff. Now, if we can do Boolean logic is, is helpful, but we need to build that up to arithmetic. Um, and that's where some more stuff comes in. And basically, we start to see w w what I'll keep on referring to as abstraction. Um, we're going to grow the abstraction um, and, and, and move further and further away from just dealing with ones and zeros or electricity and start doing these, these digital boxes. So gates are boxes containing transistors. They implement Boolean logic. Arithmetic units um, are actually boxes containing gates. Um, and again, while you can, you can do this physically in a lab to learn how to be a computer engineer, you know, in the real world, of course, these the logic gates and these these arithmetic units are microscopic, um, and they're they're developed on on silicon. So the core unit for let's say addition is called the one bit full adder, and the one bit full adder has two input, actually three inputs and two outputs. Um, and again, inside this little blue box would be a bunch of logic gates, and, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about how that's organized in a second. Electricity can flow into A or B, and, and that represents the numbers that are going to be added. And this is a one-bit adder, meaning that it simply adds um, one-bit numbers together. So if we think about zero and zero, the addition between zero and zero should equal to zero. The addition of zero and one should equal one. The addition of one and zero should equal one. And the addition of one and one should equal two. And remember, this is not ten, this is two. Right, one and one, this is a binary two. So if we want to map this here, the A obviously is flowing right here, the B is flowing in here. I've got to talk about the carry in for a second. The sum comes out here, and again, this is just one wire coming out. It can't represent two digits at the same time. This is just the ones operator. So if zero, zero come in, or if one and one come in, the output's going to be zero. And if you think back, that kind of sounds like an exclusive OR. The output carry out represents this carry here. And if you think about that, that's only going to be one. I haven't drawn them, but that will be zeros for all of these examples. One and one, then the carry out will be one. That sounds like an AND operation. It's not quite as simple as that because these things get chained together, as we'll see in a second. So in terms of a one-bit adder, we would draw it, a, a, a computer engineer would just draw it as a box with three inputs and two outputs. Um, but realistically, it would be three input signals coming in and flowing through AND gates and OR gates and XOR gates um, with a sum and a, a carry out. And to a true electronic engineer, this would be the diagram that we would use. We would use the symbols for the AND and OR gates. And this would be exclusive OR. Now the carry in allows us to chain these things together. So one bit addition is really, you know, you can only produce one plus one is two at best. Um, for if we if we grow this a little bit though, we can chain these one bit adders together to create a four bit adder. Um, so let's let's kind of talk carefully about how how this is actually working. So 
I'm going to pretend that I'm, I'm going to I'm going to add the numbers four and six. So the the base ten numbers four and six, and we know of course that that should be ten. Right? And we know the output should be one zero one zero. That's that's the binary number ten. Remember, this is worth one, this is worth two, this is worth four, this is worth eight. Eight plus two is ten. Right? Four place is one here for a four. The four place and the two place is one. That's the number six in binary. Now think of these as not numbers, but actual wires. These are transistors. These are wires. This is electricity flowing. This is this is stuff coming from a magnetic device. This is electrical charge. And we've connected wires. Again, not copper wires, probably just silicon grooves through through a wafer. Um, but no, nevertheless, electricity is flowing. Right? So electricity is connected from this ones digit over here and the ones digit over here, the two inputs for the ones digit. They're flowing into a one bit adder that we saw just before. Nothing is connected to the carry, so there is no carry ever coming in. If zero and zero come in, the, fu the fu one bit full adder will output zero as the sum and zero as the carry. So now, once that, that's actually done, we're starting to see some computation because now the zero flows into the next one bit adder. The one comes in, the zero comes in. Zero plus one plus zero essentially is still one. The output will come out as one for that second place. Notice they're, ca they're, they're being performed independently. One plus zero plus the zero coming through here is just one, so there's no carry, so zero comes into this one bit adder. One comes in, one comes in, one plus one is one zero. The sum unit would be zero. One plus one is two, which would equal one zero. The zero goes out here, the one comes out of the carry. Now here's where the carry in really starts to work because the, the carry comes in one, zero, zero, zero plus zero plus one is going to give us our one and our one is going to come out. So by chaining the carry ins to the carry outs across right to left, we can actually perform four bit addition now. And the largest number we can represent is still just 15, 0 through 15, um, 16 different options. On a 32 bit machine, on a 64 bit machine, we just repeat the same process each time. There's no difference. It's the same fundamental concept, it's just chaining them together. So, for, uh, so you know, at the at the elementary level, a one bit adder um, is really all we need, and then we can just chain them together to perform larger computations. And subtraction will work similarly. Multiplication and division are a little bit harder. Um, they're certainly going to require more circuitry, but they are they are possible as well. So. Uh, my hope is that just from seeing this diagram, um, we have not certain, certainly have a little bit of appreciation as to how addition can be done. We've taken electrical signals, just wires, and we've put them together through these devices to to get some output that would represent the sum. Um, and hopefully, you know, taking my word for it that we can do the other operations. And you know, certainly as computers have become more sophisticated. There have been shortcuts, there have been ways to make this faster, but essentially it remains the same. Um, computers can clearly represent numbers using electricity. And now, hopefully, you're starting to see that computers could also perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, the arithmetic, using digital circuitry. The next thing, the second thing that I said that computers could do were remember things. Um, and I'm not going to go into in as much detail in terms of how memory can be implemented. Um, and memory in, in, a, in a computer comes in a lot of varieties. We've got our hard drive, um, which is a totally different device. We've got main memory, um, which, which again, is a little bit different with what, than what I have on the screen here. Um, we've got various levels of memory, but the lowest level of memory that we use is called a register. And registers are often implemented through circuitry called a flip-flop, which is very similar to these logic gates that we've seen. There, there are a few couple of dozen transistors um, with a control signal going in and will allow us to, to hold on to a charge, hold on to an electrical signal. So based on a set of controls, when we, when we put a, an electrical charge through this flip-flop, it'll continue to output 
one um, until we tell it not to. All right, so it can essentially remember something for a while. And we'll call that a flip-flop. We can change states um, whenever we want it to, and we can control its state as to be one and zero. And that'll allow us, if we think about putting one of these flip-flops at each one of these digits, we can remember a number indefinitely until we turn the power off. And again, as we, when we talk about hard drives a little bit, we'll, we'll discuss how we can have this, this stuff survive past the power turning off. Now moving up, and, and again, we're, we're covering probably an entire semester's worth of a first year um, computer engineering course here in about 30 minutes or about 20 minutes. So you know, granted, we're going pretty, pretty fast here. Um, but building up from that, um, we know that a computer can store data, so we can store things in memory, we can store things in registers, which is where we would hold numbers to do arithmetic on it. Um, they, they both do the same thing, um, they just do it a little quicker. We have very few registers, they work very quickly, uh, made memories a little slower. We also know that the computer can do addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide, and it can also load and store things from memory. So you've got, you know, at the very basic, you've got five distinct operations. Um, so you've, you've got a whole bunch of digital hardware circuitry sitting on this, this central processing unit or CPU, and we need to tell the CPU, well, what do we want to do? Uh, what do we want to do at what time? And the way we do this is by setting up instructions. Um, so we would load up instructions in memory, and the computer, the, the CPU, will extract one operation at a time and execute it. So X instructions are, are typically divided into what are called an opcode, which means do one specific operation. And in fact, <clears throat> depending on the architecture, the computer might actually do addition, subtraction, multiply, and divide on every pair of number that we give it, but we might only listen to the output for add and subtract or, or divide, or listen to very one specific output. Um, so the opcode tells the computer which, which part of the circuitry to actually connect to a register to store an output. The other three, or, or four, or, or two, depending on the architecture, are the operands. And typically, they refer to register numbers. So this instruction, for instance, and I'm, and I'm sort of making this up here, but may, let's say 001 refers to addition, and 010 refers to subtraction. This binary number might, might basically be interpreted as add the value that's stored in register 1, which would be this one, and the value that's stored in register 2, which would be this one, this would be register 0, and store the result in register 0. So this, this operation, although it just looks as if you looked at this in, 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 in raw form, it would just look like a big binary number. It's not actually just a binary number. The first three digits are telling you which operation to execute. The next digit is telling you the input, the, the location where the value, the first input is stored, the location where the second input is stored, and the location where to store the output. This opcode and these, the, the, these, these binary numbers flow into what's called a controller, which is just more logic gates. The controller will activate these registers It'll bring in the current or the actual state of those numbers. Remember, these are just ones and zeros, a whole bunch of ones and zeros in each register. To, to let's say this is a 16-bit architecture, it'd be 16 ones and zeros in this one, 16 ones and zeros here. They would flow into the controller and in into the ALU, which is called an arithmetic and logic unit. The opcode 001, standing for addition, would flow in as well. And given those inputs, 001 plus these two numbers, the ALU will have one bit adders, and it will perform the addition. And current will flow out. And this wire kind of represents 16 bits. If it's a 16 system, it's a 32 bit. Um, if it's a 32 bit system, maybe we'd have 32 individual wires. Any output would flow into register zero. So let me flick over here. And, and here's the important thing about this diagram, that not so much the registers and all that. We're not going to think about all that much about which registers we have and what, what we're not going to think about necessarily these binary instructions this, um, all the time. Although we will have to discuss that a bit in the next module. But what you want to see here is that these are just wires. These are just wires connecting 
flip-flops in main memory into a controller which has a bunch of logic gates. Um, there's going to be electricity flowing from this flip-flop in here, from this in here. These are going to go into the ALU. Right? Three lines of electricity. Again, these wires represent however many bits we're, we're using for a number. So if this is a 32-bit numbering system, it's really 32 wires. That's going to flow in here. It's going to go through a one-bit adder and another one-bit adder and another one until we've added together all the bits and then flow out of here and into this register. This distance is the distance the electricity needs to flow through this digital system. That is going to govern clock speed. The amount of time it takes electricity to flow through this device will determine how many instructions we can execute per second. When I see a clock speed of, of let's say 2 gigahertz, a 2 gigahertz processor, that means that this can happen 2 billion times a second. And what limits this? Well, some, in some, some respects, the complexity of the, the circuitry. In other respects, the material. Right? So silicon transmits electricity very, very quickly with very little resistance. Electricity at, in a vacuum would, would flow or move at the speed of light. We don't have a vacuum. We've got electricity flowing through materials. Um, electricity th flowing through copper wires in your walls in your home and in this building don't go as st the electricity doesn't transmit as fast as it would through silicon and it's because copper wires provide more resistance and they generate more heat silicon is used in a, in a computer chip because it can it can allow electricity to be transmitted with very little resistance uh, meaning it can go very very quickly um, not near the speed of light but but much much faster than through some other materials um, the other thing that factors into this is how big this thing is. If I can divide, if I can design this whole thing really, really small, then the electricity has a lot less distance to go through. So the factors for clock speed really amount to not more complicated circuitry. We don't make the computer faster generally by making it more complicated or anything like that. We still have the same basic fundamentals to computer engineering as we did really 30 years ago. But we build these chips smaller, and we build these chips with better materials, um, which allows the electricity to flow through faster and faster and faster. And we've reached sort of an upper limit. We can't really design much smaller than we are now. So you have seen the, this is cropped up, right? This gets a little bit bigger, right? You can go out and buy, you know, uh, three gigahertz machines fairly cheaply, but we don't see, you know, 100 gigahertz machines, and we're probably not going to see them for a while. And the reason is because of material constraints. It has nothing to do with the field of computer science. It's more a material science issue. Um, and that's why you also see now most machines coming with multiple computer, multiple CPUs to get around that. Now, in terms of numbers, this is the, the, the idea, but, but we still have this big giant disconnect between all the things that we can do with a computer. We do every day. We can, we, you know, we can type essays, we can record video, we can post video, we can you know, go on the internet, we can, uh, we can do just about anything. Um, with a computer. Um, and I said in the beginning of this module that it's all about arithmetic. Um, well, how does that make any sense? Well, one of the ways that that, that may, starts to make a little sense is that the other things that we observe with a computer can be represented as numbers. Um, so let's switch back here. And let's just think about a screen, um, the slides that you see right here. These aren't numbers. Um, how does a computer display this if all a computer can do is arithmetic and hold numbers? Um, well, one of the things that we can do is we can, we can represent colors by numbers. Um, and you, know, you think about color by number. Um, you learned it when you were probably, maybe you, you did that kind of thing when you were a little kid in kindergarten. Um, that's basically what's happening with a computer screen. Um, the entire screen is divided into a grid and each point, each, each little individual point on the screen um, is called a pixel. So if you look at this slide here, and you see these gradients and these changes of colors. Every single location can have a color assigned to it. 
and we don't we don't assign colors by name we assign number colors by number meaning we can encode colors as a number and as long as we've got big enough numbers we can represent almost every single color that we can see now the individual numbers will be stored remembered in memory in a special place in memory actually called the frame buffer um, and then the actual LCD screen or whatever the screen you have attached to your monitor or your computer will actually read that memory the the, the plug that you plug the computer back to this uh, to the monitor will transmit each individual value for each individual pixel and then the LCD screen is responsible for for turning that into light of the appropriate color um, so if we think about you know encoding color if we used one bit we could store zero or one which would give us black or white if we use three bits this is sort of the standard numeric convention for three bits or for, for um, eight basic colors 000, zero, zero represents the absence of color, the absence of light, black. Um, the first column represents blue. All right, so if we do zero, zero, 001, that'll be complete pure blue. The second column is green. Um, zero, 010 zero would be green. A combination of those two columns will be a cyan, which is essentially blue and, blue and green together. 100 zero, zero is red. The 101 would be red and a little bit of, and blue and will turn up as purple or magenta. We've got yellow as a combination of red and green, and then all three all at once is represented as white or white light. Now for three bit, I would only have eight options. I wouldn't be able to, to, to do something very, or do anything very um, engaging. Um, but if I use 24 bits, meaning I'd have a few million colors, if you remember 32 bits gave us um, over 4 billion, we don't actually need 32 bits. 24 bits will give us a a enough independent or, or separately identifiable colors that any more the human eye can't even distinguish. So basically 24 bits is all the color, we can represent all the colors that the human eye can, can, can understand or, or distinguish. Text, um, when we type on a keyboard, um, the, the computer really doesn't see our symbols. When we type the letter R, the computer does not think of that as the letter R. The computer thinks of that as some number. You, if you, when you type the capital letter G, really the computer sees it as the number 71. And this is, this is a table of what are called ASCII, the ASCII um, table. Um, it's the number, the, the mapping between the decimal 10 base number to a specific character. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of data types later on. When we store characters, this has some implications with this. But each individual character on the keyboard just maps to a number. And the keyboard will send that number over to the computer. We'll load that, that number will be stored temporarily in memory, and then we can use it. And we can, we can apply arithmetic to it if we need to. Um, ultimately, and then, of course, that's just really just scratching the surface. But if we think about you know text, and, and actually, let me go back for a second. Um, I, I, I mentioned um, computer mapping numbers back and to, to draw these actual characters. Um, we can also represent positions. So as I move my mouse around, um, these positions on the screen are transmitted, and then the computer just simply draws my mouse cursor. Um, and this really just scratches the surface. Um, if we represent things as numbers, we can, it might be tedious, right? And it will be tedious. In fact, if you were really to think about all the ins and outs of what a computer does, it's an exceptionally tedious process. Um, there's lots and lots of steps. I mean, think about the idea of, of assigning numbers to every single pixel. You've got millions of pixels here. At each time the screen changes, you need to recompute which color should be there. It's an enormously tedious process, but what allows us to work with this well is that first of all as programmers we are going to work with abstractions we're going to work it with higher level languages like C++ and that's what the rest of the modules in this course will be about but also remember that e even though it's tedious the computer can do it billions of times of second so it might not be the most efficient process it might be not it might not be the most efficient way of representing text and representing um, colors but it works exceptionally well for a computer system because we can do these instructions so fast. But everything that the computer does 
It does as a combination of arithmetic and storing numbers. And it does because we as a programmer is going to tell it, are going to tell the computer what to do um, using these basic operations. Um, so sort of concluding our little intro, um, most of the talk that we just went through when, I, when we talk about the central processing unit and output and ASCII code, they will come up. We will hear these terms again, but it's not the core focus of this course. The core focus of this course is learning how to program and write programs to make the computer do different things. Um, but what I want you to get out of this module more than anything else is the idea that the computer really isn't very smart. It's just a bunch of circuitry. It just does arithmetic, it just stores numbers, and it only does what you tell it to do. The computer will never do anything unless you specifically tell it to do it. I can't stress that enough. As you proceed through the rest of these modules in this course, you will write programs yourself and, and they won't work. They will not work the first time. Uh, I promise you that. When I write programs, when any programmer writes develops code, um, it doesn't work the first time. Don't get frustrated. Don't think the computer's not working. Um, you have to look at the, the, the errors that you come up with. It's part of the learning process. It will always be because you didn't tell the computer to do what you thought you told it to do. Or you didn't tell the computer to do what you meant. And the computer never assumes. Um, the computer rigidly adds numbers together. And so it will never be able to sort of figure out what you meant. And just keep that in mind. Don't get angry. Um, you always have to go back and look at your code and figure out what did you not explain. I like to, to leave this off with, with the idea of you know, whenever you're programming, think of the computer as a three-year-old. Um, you need to tell it very explicit instructions. You need to tell it all the details, and you need to not leave anything out. Um, and, but unlike a three-year-old, it will actually do what you tell it to do.